Hey everybody, welcome to this evening's webinar, uh, Building Custom Kitchen Cabinets presented by Justin Fink. We're gonna wait a little bit to make sure everybody is in the room, but if you give us about 15 or 20 seconds, maybe 30, then we'll get rolling. Justin, it's a pleasure to see you again. It's been a while. Yes, sir. It's, I'm, I'm happy to be back. Happy to be talking about a, a topic that I, I love. Can I ask you, are, are you coming to us from your uh, third floor of your house? <laughs> yes, I am in my, I'm in my attic. Not the third floor, second floor. It's, a, it's, a, it's just a, an unfinished part of my second floor. Yeah. And it looks like you need to scrape some paint off those window sashes. Yeah, how would I just you know. do this? <laughs> there you go. I'll yeah. Scrape. <laughs> Yeah, you caught me. I did need to do a little, do a little window scraping. Uh, I'm Patrick McComb, and I'll be your host for the evening. Uh, I'm also joined by Shane Pedigo, who works for Cab Parts, and we're going to talk to him more later. Um, if you don't know Justin mm -hmm. Fink, uh, if, if you don't know Justin Fink, Justin is our former editorial director of F Fine Home Building. Justin has more than 16 years of experience building, restoring, and doing woodworking and founded Fink and Sons Carpentry and Woodworking in 2020 after the birth of his son. Uh, in addition to historic buildings, Justin has worked on additions, upgrades, and customized build-ins for buildings with modern style. I wanna thank Cab Parts tonight for being uh, the sponsor tonight. Cab Parts has been providing custom cabinet and closet components, doors, drawer boxes, and hardware to industry professionals since 1987 it is really great to have them part of our program tonight. Uh, Shane Pedigo, production manager from Cab Parts, will be with us and he'll join us at the end of Justin's presentation and be available uh, for questions uh, during the Q&A session. Uh, if you guys have any comments or questions during the show, please direct them to the chat box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. When talking in the chat box, be sure your settings are set to all attendees and panelists. If you have a comment to share with everyone, direct your questions for the Q&A session to the Q&A tab. We'll be dedicating about 15 minutes after Justin's presentation to try and get in as many questions as we can. And I will say from my own experience, these things are way better when you all ask questions. So I'm hoping uh, you'll do that because it makes for a way better show and you get the tailored information you need. So with all that said, uh, Shane and I are gonna go off the screen and uh, let Justin take it away. You ready, Justin? Sure, let's do it. All right, man. Um, so I don't, I don't know. Are we using the, the chat function? Do you know, Patrick? Or are we going to use the chat function off to the side? Yes, please. And if you okay. have a question that you want asked uh, for everyone to hear uh, for sure at the Q and A section, put it there. And I would say uh, put it both places because it yep. would be helpful. Yeah, yeah. and it, it, everybody who's in here, just um, pop open that chat box and and throw throw your location and and what you're hoping to get out of the presentation. And hopefully I can uh, um, help tailor this a little bit. This will be kind of an informal uh, walkthrough of, um, let's call it, uh, a lot of it is tips and tricks. Some of it uh, helpful lessons I learned along the way on my own. Uh, some of it is um, uh, a, a good portion of it actually are, are tips and tricks that I've learned from other fine home building contributors um, and also from reading um, fine woodworking for many years. Uh, I like to consider what I do sort of a, a cross between carpentry and woodworking, kind of maybe taking the best parts of each one and uh, combining them together and not getting too fussy with woodworking side and maybe not too, too crass or crude with the carpentry side. Um, and I think that's kind of the balance when you're making your own cabinetry for, for kitchens. You need to be sort of straddling that line. You need to know when to... Um, when to think like a woodworker and when to think like a carpenter. So we're gonna go through some of that stuff today. Um, so without further ado, we'll just dive in and um, continue to, to, to use that, that chat box. Um, you can uh, fire, long, fire off questions as you're going through um, or uh, we'll circle back and we'll talk about some things at the end. All right, so building custom kitchen cabinets. Um, I think for conversations like this, the best approach is to always start with design. Um, I'm a huge advocate for design. Uh, I work a lot in really old buildings and my, my stance on, on architecture and design is pretty much that a lot of this stuff has been figured out 
Um, and it's our job to basically just not screw it up. Uh, there's a lot of good advice out there. You don't need to reinvent the wheel unless you're into more of a modern aesthetic. Um, uh, there's a lot to pull from in terms of uh, past successes. And um, a, good, a good deal of that is gonna be focused around proportions. So let me just run through a few slides here that just talk about first, um, kind of what I would consider like golden rules of, of designing a kitchen cabinet. Um, we'll talk about base cabinets here, but these rules basically apply to cabinetry in general. Um, if you want them, everything to look good in the end, your doors should always be taller than they are wide. And I can't tell you how many times I see this, this advice not followed. Um, if, if your cabinet doors are wider than they are tall, you need to think about splitting them so that you have a more vertical look. Um, again, the same, the same sort of idea applies to skinny drawer fronts. Um, if, you, if you do paneled doors on a cabinet, when you get down to a certain drawer height, um, you want to you want to think about switching to a solid slab front rather than trying to cram a frame and panel drawer front into uh, a small space. And, and so what's considered a small space, I would say anything, anything six inches or less, five inches or less, you're going to definitely want to be thinking about this, but it is a little bit up to the eye of the holder. Um, just kind of general talk, because we're going we're gonna to hit a lot of terminology here, and I don't know how much everybody knows, but um, when we talk about the face frame of the cabinet, which is the solid wood that is applied to the, the plywood boxes, um, the terminology is that the, the pieces that run vertically are called styles. The pieces that run horizontally are called rails. And we're gonna be using that terminology throughout the whole night. And that also applies to the end panels. It applies to pretty much any situation where you have a face frame style. Of course, you can also have Euro style cabinets, which don't have a face frame. Um, I almost never get asked to do that kind of cabinetry. So um, I, don't, I don't have as much advice to share in that category, but I think you're gonna find that what we go over tonight, uh, a lot of it is going to apply. And so I don't think we need to do anything special in terms of delineating between uh, face frame cabinetry, which is what you see in this picture and European style, which is, um, certainly common, especially when it comes to ready to assemble mail order cabinetry. <clears throat> um, okay, so getting a little bit deeper into pro proportions, here's kind of the way that I look at it. Um, I like the end styles, the ones at the end of the cabinet to be about an inch and three quarter wide. Um, anything, anything intermediate, which is sort of inboard of those ends, I like to be around inch, inch and a quarter, inch and a half at most. Um, and that really, what, what those wider end styles do for you is it gives you kind of uh, a natural termination point visually. And uh, if you make everything the same, um, which is fine, if you have a bunch of cabinets banked together, that's what you want to do. You want everything to look like it's um, homogenous across the cabinetry. Um, but if, if you're kind of taking your cues from furniture building, which is where kitchen cabinets really got their start is things like Hoosier cabinet, which is a freestanding uh, dry storage cabinet for kitchens in the you know, 20s and 30s. Um, cabinets, kitchen cabinets as we know them today are really kind of an offshoot of that. And so we still have to think about that furniture uh, type look. And that's why, as I have drawn here, um, I have the end panels going all the way down to the floor. Um, you'll also see that there's a toe kick, which is the space underneath the cabinet. Uh, you really want to think about the standard toe kick is three inches by four inches. So three inches deep by four inches tall. Um, and typically, um, when you think of a kitchen, when you think of a cabinet, the toe kick, um, doesn't necessarily have an, an end to it. So you might see if, you, if this cabinet jogs in three inches and then down four inches, you would be able to see the open end on the end of a run of cabinetry. So we use an end panel to cover that and dress up the outside edge of a, of a run of cabinetry. Um, you don't need a toe kick if you aren't likely to be standing in front of the cabinet doing anything on the, on the countertop. So what do I mean by that is, um, Obviously, if you're standing at the kitchen sink doing dishes or the uh, if you have a cooktop built in, 
you're going to want to have a toe kick um, because you're likely to stand kind of fronted right up to those cabinets while you're working on the countertop. Um, but it can be kind of fun and uh, visually interesting to abandon the toe kick in places where you are not likely to stand in front of it. Um, examples of that might be if you have a, a hutch that um, has just a little slim run of countertop on it that really is just made to connect one side of the a run of cabinets to the other, or you have um, some other uh, floor to, to ceiling pantry. Um, those are places where you can abandon the toe kick and switch to kind of a more formal uh, baseboard look. And that can help, again, make it feel like uh, a little bit of a, a more of a piece of furniture. You'll also notice that the, um, that the rails right above the toe kick are in alignment roughly with the bottom rail of the end panel. And that's not an accident. Um, typically that's the top of that end panel bottom rail is gonna be five, uh, let's say five and a quarter, five and a half off of the floor. Um, and that's that kind of mimics uh, typical baseboard molding. But again, it also is very purposeful. It's meant to line up with that, uh, that bottom rail of the front of the cabinet. Um, and just kind of a side note here, when, when I, I meant to say this in the last slide, when you're thinking about these rails and styles, one thing I didn't notice, let me go back here, is you'll see that the rails always terminate against the style. The styles run top to bottom uninterrupted. Rails always butt into those. And you're gonna see the same thing if you do frame and panel doors. I don't have the lines drawn into these doors, but the rails and styles also apply to doors and it's the same thing. The styles of the doors run top to bottom uninterrupted and the rails butt into them. You always want to follow that. It, you don't want to be tempted to, uh, let's say, underneath this drawer box here, uh, run that rail continuously all the way across and then have this little cut up sections of styles running between them. It, it's just kind of a, a rule of construction you don't break when you're building cabinetry. Um, let's see, anything else we want to talk about on here? Oh, we're, at, we're back at that end panel again. So the, like I said, the bottom rail is, um, let's call it five and a quarter, five and a half wide. And then the upper rail, if there's any question uh, about how high to make that, um, we certainly want it to be smaller than the bottom. Um, but a good rule of thumb is to, is to size it down um, by the golden rule, the golden rectangle, which is essentially like a, um, it's, it's a uh, kind of a benchmark of good architecture um, where everything relates uh, as a ratio to a smaller number. Um, and that's what I've sized this to. I think this top rail comes out to, I think it's like three and an eighth, somewhere around there. And that visually, if you resort to that golden rectangle, the golden rule, it's going to, it's going to steer you in the right direction and end up with pleasing proportions. And as I say at the top there, proportions are everything. Um, what else? Uh, you'll notice that the door rails and styles are wider than the rails and styles of the cabinet themselves. Uh, you can also match those, um, but you don't want to be skinnier. Um, we talked a little about toe kicks. This is a way here. This, this is um, a drawing from Marianne Cusato um, that appeared in Fine Home Building. Um, this is a, a couple of different options of, of pleasing ways that you can change. Um, you, can, you can kind of play with the baseboard detail on a cabinet. Um, and what we're seeing here is that the, the right-hand portion of each of these drawings is kind of jutted out, um, which is typical if you have um, one part of your cabinetry that's a deeper depth than the rest so that it breaks up that run of cabinetry and creates kind of an interesting jog. Uh, you can have bracket details on those jutted out portions of the cabinetry to again, make it feel a little bit more like a piece of furniture. Um, on the left, we have the Seamer Reversa, which kind of mimics the crown molding, quarter round, which is my favorite. I, I use that most of the time. Square corner, I don't particularly care for, but it does have some historical roots and certainly works, especially if you're trying to emphasize um, nice vertical, clean lines and square corners. All right, so <clears throat> when we're talking about, that's kind of like the high level design talk. We can go on and on about design, but it's enough to get us started. When we're talking about building cabinets in the traditional style where we have a face frame, um, 
it comes down to the question of do you build the boxes first or the face frames first? Um, and there really isn't a right or wrong answer. My personal preference is to build the face frames first. Um, then once I, the, uh, the reason for that is the boxes take up a lot of space. If you don't have a big shop and you build all these boxes first, you're gonna run out of rooms, run out of room to build the face frames. Um, it also is helpful to me to, to map out the face frames. And uh, then uh, if I have to make any changes, the face frames are relatively inexpensive to fix or even scrap and rebuild. Whereas if I have a dimension off in a plywood box, um, it, it's a little more cumbersome to either take it apart and fix it or to have to alter it um, after it's already in a box shape and I need to trim it for some reason. Uh, I also like having face frames done first because then I can take measurements directly off those face frames and make sure those boxes fit really well, which we'll get into. Um, all that to say, I like to start with face frames. What I'm about to show you does not necessarily mean you have to start with face frames. I'm just going to start there in terms of this presentation. Um, the first decision when you're talking about face frames is going to be thinking about materials. Uh, this goes hand in hand with design as well. Um, in terms of paint grade cabinetry, any cabinetry that's, that's going to get a coat of paint on it, uh, you want to think about uh, durability kind of above all else. Um, let's, let's call it durability and the ability to take a nice smooth coat of paint. Um, so you're going to steer more towards poplar and soft maple, which are two, um, they've traditionally been economical choices that are also strong and stable. Um, poplar is typically what I use. I like how it works. It's a little bit softer than soft maple, um, a little bit more forgiving to tool and to uh, drill through and fasten. Um, but I know a number of custom cabinet shops that rely on soft maple. Um, you know, they have, uh, they do this every day and they're more accustomed to, to working with soft maple. And it, if durability is paramount, then I think soft maple probably does have the advantage over poplar. Uh, I would avoid things like pine. Um, pine is inexpensive and it, it sure is nice to work with. It's nice and easy to tool and it smells great when you're working with it. It gives you that kind of romantic carpenter vibe, but um, it's a little soft um, unless that's the aesthetic you're going for, which is kind of the, you know, the worn in look, but I would steer clear of that. Um, you don't need to go so far in the durability spectrum that you're, that you're considering hard maple or um, any, you know, red oak, white oak, I, it, you know, you'd be spending a bunch of money for something that's going to get covered in paint. Um, and those are really, uh, at that point, you're probably going beyond the usefulness of how much you're going to spend money on. Um, now, if we're thinking about, that's paint grade. If we're thinking about stain grade, um, the number one thing that, that I always like to remind people is that you need to think about the color of the wood you're picking over time. Um, most woods that you choose, um, whether you, if you, let's say if you're gonna choose a, a hard wood and you have countless options, um, if you're putting a clear coat of finish over that or an oil finish, like a rub in oil, uh, that wood is gonna naturally darken over time or it's gonna, let's say it's, nat it's gonna naturally change in color over time. Um, typically that means it's gonna darken. Sometimes it can bleach a little bit if you have a little strong sunlight on it. Uh, so while it, it might look really pretty, when you're milling up cherry to make a face frame, um, that nice little kind of salmon color that you get out of cherry, uh, don't freak out because it's really gonna turn to kind of a dark brown if you give it a year or so. Um, it typically actually happens pretty quick. Um, so uh, that's something to keep in mind to set expectations for customers or spouses when you're doing this kind of work. Um, Sometimes it can be a little bit of a shock when you have a game plan and then you put these cabinets together and you, you, you deliver them to the site or you put them in your own kitchen and uh, either uh, the color is, a, is not what you were hoping for um, or you were hoping for that color and then you're disappointed a year later when it's really changed. Of course, stain is always an option, pigment, pigmentation um, to change the, the color of the wood or to supplement it in some way using dyes and stains to which you can play with to enhance the grain. Um, again, you want to think about, um, you know, how is how is that color going to play with the rest of the space? Um, if you are going to choose a stain, then you want to definitely do some hard thinking about 
the type of wood that you choose um, for that stain grade project. Um, there are certain woods that take stain much better than others. Uh, oak is a traditional favorite because it tends to stain pretty easily uh, and evenly. Um, pine and cherry, uh, they can be a little more blotchy. Um, not to say that that any you can stain any wood, it just might you might need to change your plan of attack in terms of getting a nice even result with the color, depending on what species of wood you choose. Um, uh, there's a number of fine woodworking articles on uh, stains and application of stains. And we also have a number of articles at Fine Home Building um, that will teach you how to use dyes and stains in combination to get some really stunning results. Uh, so those are definitely worth a look if you're going to go down that path. Um, like I say at the bottom, I mean, the sky's the limit in terms of what, what species you choose. Uh, you want to think about things like grain pattern and uh, the porosity of the, of the wood. You know, is it, a, is it a tight, closed, smooth face like maple or cherry or walnut? Or is it more open grain like uh, oak or ash? Um, those are going to really uh, change the feel of the cabinetry. Um, it's going to change how stain looks on it because of the way the stain absorbs into pores versus um, onto a smooth surface. And it's going to change um, how your clear coat is applied to that cabinetry, uh, meaning that it's going to take more work to make a porous uh, wood-like oak look nice and smooth to get an even sheen, depending on what level of, of sheen you want for a clear coat. Um, so all those things are going to factor in. Um, at this point, you're probably going, Jesus, why am I going to build my own cabinets? But trust me, it's we're getting there. We're getting the fun stuff. Um, OK, so let's talk about construction of face frames. Uh, you'll see in the upper left hand photo there uh, what you see. It's a tight photo, I know, but it's two pieces of face frame stacked on top of each other on the bed of a miter saw. And in the back of the miter saw bed, there's a sacrificial fence that ha that that you set up once and you make a direct 90 degree cut through. And now that factory, or sorry, that uh, sacrificial fence has an exact uh, exact groove that matches the width of your saw blade. This makes it super handy for making really accurate cuts. So what I'm doing here is I have one piece of face frame that I've cut to length and I put it over the top of a second piece of face frame that I need to be exactly the same length. Of course, you could you could mark it with a pencil, but anytime you're marking something or measuring something and transferring that measurement to a mark, uh, it becomes a chance where you can make an error. So if at all possible, I like to set up a positive stop, something on the bed of the miter saw or table saw that I can jam a piece up against and do repeatable cuts that are all going to end up being the same. Or if I have a bunch of one off things uh, or you know smaller groups of things, I'll use this technique where I can stack one piece on top of the other, slide the whole assembly over until it's just touching that kerf line in the back of my sacrificial fence. And then when I bring the blade down, I'm guaranteed it's gonna be exactly the same from one piece to the next. And I'm realizing while I'm talking, I can see that miter saw in the larger picture with where you see me standing there. Um, in the background, you can see my miter saw and you get a little clearer picture of that sacrificial fence. It's just stuck on there with double stick tape or you can bolt it on depending on how your saw works. Uh, second photo down, what you're looking at here is the end of a, uh, a face frame part. Um, things to note here are I typically use pocket screws for the joint of face frames. You can use uh, domino tenons. You can use uh, biscuits. Biscuits are a little trickier um, because of the size of the biscuit compared to the width of the, uh, the face frame components. Sometimes it, the, the width doesn't work out. Um, I typically like uh, pocket screws because they're fast. Uh, I don't need to clamp things up and wait for it to dry. I can just kind of, you know, rock and roll and put the whole thing together. Um, what I do highly recommend is to put glue at the end of the piece before you pocket screw it together. And always, always, always use a clamp to hold those two parts together flush with each other so that there's no chance that you're gonna have any lipping. Um, not only if when you join two pieces of pocket screws, if a piece lips slightly, it's not something that's like no big deal. I'll just sand it out because you'd have to sand both sides to get it to sit perfectly flat. If you don't get that backside flat, 
now it's a problem when you go to put that face frame on a plywood box. Um, in the larger picture here, I'm using uh, a table clamp uh, that Craig makes. It's just a little metal plate that you can recess into your workbench. And then the clamp uh, that keys into that so you can clamp the whole assembly down to the tabletop to get everything nice and flat. And another cool thing in here that uh, I started to do is to actually use a blank piece of wood that's exactly the size that I need that drawer box opening to be or that cabinet opening to be. You can use scraps of plywood, whatever you have on hand. Um, this is especially handy if you have a lot of the same size component or all of your cabinet doors are roughly uh, uh, consistent um, across your installation. I like to put that piece, I label it and put it right on the table. I fit my face frame parts around it, clamp everything down, screw it together, and then I can just pull that that sacrificial uh, spacer out. And I know that I've gotten really square assembly that's exactly on the mark. I'm not I'm not looking for pencil lines and that kind of thing when I'm when I'm coming to assemble my face frame. Um, one thing that I, I didn't mention that's crucial is starting with really well dressed stock too when you're when you're doing face frames. That means you, you cut all your pieces and run them through the thickness planer in both directions on edge and on face so that everything is exactly the same thickness and exactly the same width. Consistency is key. Um, if you have a cabinet or you have a kitchen full of cabinets, mill all of your face frame parts at one time. Don't build three cabinets, then start building boxes, then get sidetracked with something else, buy more stock mill that because the chances that you're going to get everything dialed in on your thickness planer exactly the same is 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 low so get prepped for for doing all your face frames at one time and then do them all at one time um let's see here end panels this is um we talked earlier about kind of furniture like end panels this one is actually not a kitchen cabinet this was a a vanity end panel, but the technique is the same. You can see that we're looking at the back side of the panel right now and everything's pocket screwed together. And then I just clamped it down um, and used a, a rabbiting bit on a router uh, to cut a, a rabbit on the back side of the face frame. And you can see in the background what the end result is when you drop a piece of MDF or, or plywood into that rabbit. Um, it makes a nice, clean looking end panel that isn't traditionally assembled like you would a floating frame and panel design. Um, just something to consider there. Uh, again, if this is gonna be something that you're gonna apply stain to, you might wanna make a decision about whether you're going to pre-finish, pre-stain and finish your panels before assembly or after assembly. Sometimes it can be easier to uh, pre-finish all of those panels first. Um, let's see anything else we want to talk about. Oh, the corners of these round overs, um, or rabbits rather, uh, you'll see that they're rounded over naturally here because of the, the, the radius the router bit. You can either cut your panels to also have a radius, or you can chisel, chisel those out square before you put the panels in. Um, so talking about corner options, uh, this, this is going to be uh, crucial when you're uh, joining your face frame with the side, either the, the face frame and end panel or the face frame and just uh, plywood end of a cabinet box. Um, all the way over to the left is uh, face frame flushed out to the edge of the plywood. Um, the next one coming in from your left is what you would typically see if you bought a kitchen cabinet uh, off the shelf and that the face frame usually overhangs the edge of the plywood just slightly. That's both to allow you to join two cabinets together, face frame to face frame, edge to edge, and the plywood doesn't interfere. It also gives you a little bit of scribe and wiggle room, but most importantly, it gives a little bit of a fudge factor so that you don't need everything to line up exactly perfectly um, from the edge of the box to the edge of the face frame. The third option over, which I really don't see much reason to do, but I know that some people do it, is a, a long miter joint. Um, those are typically harder to assemble. Uh, they're more fussy to deal with and they don't offer a huge advantage unless you're getting into something where you really need to have dead perfect grain matching that, that runs around the corner of a cabinet. My personal favorite is all the way over on the right hand side, which is uh, a full thickness plywood edge or, or end panel that comes in to a rabbit. And what it leaves is just a, 
If you look at it from the front, you don't see anything. If you look at it from the side, you see a little bit of, of the edge of the front face frame as you're going down the side, which is typically easily concealed um, in the finishing process. But most importantly, it gives you a lot of glue surface, which makes it really strong. And it still gives me ample room to, to put fasteners in, which you can just fill later. So I like that. Um, it's easy to mill. It's super strong. It's positive in terms of alignment. So I don't need to, to kind of gauge uh, how things line up. Um, kind of like I was saying earlier, kind of the it's that it's straddling that line between woodworking and carpentry or something like that. Um, so with those kind of real high level face frame talking points out of the way, um, let's let's talk a little bit about building the boxes. Um, your first decision is going to be about the materials you use. Uh, you know, let's let's assume for the purposes of this conversation, you're not building your cabinet boxes out of solid wood, which I guess is possible. Um, everybody and their mother is using plywood or sheet goods of some kind. Uh, it matters which type you choose. I think people are often surprised when they come into this world to realize how many options there are with sheet goods and it is endless. And I know we're gonna talk about that more with Shane at the end when we talk about um, some of the cabinet parts you can order from cab parts. Uh, you know, they'll make them just about out of anything you can, you can imagine. So, uh, you want to choose carefully here because this this is you don't want to go to the big box store and buy the cheapest plywood you can get a good deal on um if you want good quality cabinetry grade plywood you're going to spend a lot more money than you would at the home center and the reason is because you have higher quality core in that plywood and usually higher quality veneers um and that's not that's not just important for stain grade work. It's also really important for paint grade cabinetry because if those veneer, if those cores are not nice and smooth and consistent, you might have slight ripples in the surface of your veneers, which will really translate through and, and be an eyesore underneath your paint job. So plywood core is kind of the, the standard choice. Um, you'll see it, which I could actually point to the screen. I guess I can't, um, maybe I can here. Let me hold on one second. Nope. Anyway, uh, I was hoping I could use my little mouse to point to things on the screen, but I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, right around the middle of the stack there is where you're going to see uh, plywood. Actually, I'm sorry, in the lower part of the stack is plywood. Um, and the, the number of plies in the core of the plywood is always going to be an odd number. Uh, which is designed to create stability so that you have the center core and then you have um, each ply on top of that running in a perpendicular direction to the one it's touching on, on both sides uh, to create uh, stability dimensionally and also um, to keep things from, from hopefully from curling like a potato chip. Um, plywood core is, is, like I said, the most widely available, most common is what people think of when they think of plywood. Uh, the veneers can telegraph, uh, meaning that you can see the, like I was mentioning, you can see the ripples through the veneer sometimes if those underlying uh, inner plies are not uh, high quality, they're not bonded well, or if they have uh, filled knot holes and, and bad seams. Particle board core is uh, what you would see it's like flake board, essentially. It's a lot of little tiny pieces of wood that are uh, glued up and, and super compressed with adhesive. And uh, it makes a super dead flat panel product. Uh, melamine is one example of it. Uh, typically, if you order ready to assemble cabinetry, a lot of the options out there in the world are gonna be the particle board core uh, because it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, if you're building your own cabinetry, it can be a little bit harder to work with. Uh, the dust can be a little more annoying. The, the materials are heavier typically, and um, they're, they're a little more splintery to work with if you're doing your own milling, like if you're cutting rabbits and dados and whatever else. It, it, you'd also need to use, um, Typically, you need to use what are called conformat screws for fastening those pieces. And that little inset image shows what a conformat screw is. It's it's sort of a special purpose uh, fat 
shank screw with a small head on it, uh, you know, a shallow head on it, and it uses a special drill bit. And the idea is that it, uh, it, it joins those particle boards together better than a typical screw would um, during assembly. So in my personal opinion, if I'm building my own cabinets, I'm avoiding anything with particle board. If I'm ordering cabinetry, it's certainly on the table because, um, you know, like I said, it's dead flat, uh, it's relatively inexpensive. And, you know, usually when you're ordering those parts from a cabinet company or a cabinet component supplier, they already have everything already bored out for all the fasteners and they include the fasteners or they have dowels and adhesive uh, type situations to uh, assemble everything. So it kind of takes away all of those bad, annoying parts of working with particle board because they do all of that stuff for you. Um, MDF core, you don't, you don't see this as often, but it's a, a pretty killer choice when you need to choose a panel good because it's, it kind of combines that, um, uh, it, 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 it's dead, dead flat um, so that it, the veneers look exceptional on top. It's super stable. MDF is, is very uh, dimensionally stable and uh, it eliminates, it eliminates any of those chances that those core, the plywood cores uh, are going to have any imperfections that are going to telegraph through. Because if you've ever worked with MDF, which by the way, stands for medium density fiberboard, it's, it's the brown, dark brown colored stuff. It looks like a bunch of sawdust glued together. Uh, it's very silky smooth to work with. It runs through machines beautifully. If you need to put a profile on the edge of a panel, you can, and uh, it. So you can route it. It it, it looks beautiful under a coat of paint, even if you route and tool the edges, which is not something you can say for any of the other options on the table here in terms of uh, leaving edges exposed. You either need to put some kind of face frame covering the edge of everything else or um, some sort of iron on banding. Um, the last option I have down here is called combi core. Um, that is sort of the it's the benefit. It's it's a mixture of MDF core and plywood core. It's the third one up from the bottom in this picture, where you see the three layers of plywood core in the middle, which is again perpendicular directions, and then the outer core on either side is a little thin layer of MDF, and then the veneer on top of that. It it kind of balances everything that we just talked about above. Um, let's see here. Uh, for the veneer cuts, this is the, the face of the plywood. This won't matter as much when you're doing a paint grade job, but when you're doing stain grade, it becomes really important. Rotary cut is what you're going to see most typically, and it basically means they put the log on a, on a lathe and they, and they shave off. They roll it, they spin it, and they shave it at the same time. Uh, so you end up with these kind of cathedrals of grain that look the least like a real piece of wood that you can possibly get. <laughs> so it, they can tend to look a little gaudy underneath uh, stain if you have wide swaths of uninterrupted plywood on end panels or something, um, or for panels on a door. Uh, something like uh, flat cut and plain, or plain cut, sometimes the, the terminology changes. Uh, that would be if you took the, that, that process of cutting veneer out of a log is more like you would typically cut a piece of wood out of a log. So it looks more like uh, pieces of wood glued up edge to edge. Quartered and rift cut um, is, is again, you can buy quarter sawn or rift sawn lumber. This is the same idea. It leaves you with nice kind of vertical consistent grain typically. And when you join those veneers together, um, any seams between veneers almost tend to get lost in that vertical grain. It's a really nice choice if you want something that's just uh, emphasizes a vertical or a horizontal with those with the nice continuous or nice uh, consistent grain or if you um, sometimes certain species like white oak when you rift or quarter it you get a little extra um, kind of ray flex they call them a little more interesting uh, appeal out of the lumber so some options there to consider um, Sorry, let me get rid of this. I didn't realize that was showing. So um, when we're talking about handling sheet goods, um, 
a lot of people will pick up a sheet of plywood and shove it through a table saw. I used to do the same thing. Uh, then I started using a track saw to break down sheets of plywood to get them a little closer to the final dimension I needed. And then I would run them, those pieces through the table saw to get them down to their final consistent, you know, from one piece to the next. So everything was, was nice and lined up. And then the more I worked at it, the more I got comfortable with getting really, really accurate with the track saw. And now that is kind of my favorite method. It doesn't replace the table saw for all shop tasks, but it sure makes it easy to break down sheet goods quickly and accurately if you spend some time getting things right. Um, as you can see in the photos, I work from a tabletop uh, in my shop and uh, because space is a little on the tighter side, I, I, uh, I uh, fold up my sub, uh, my sub support underneath the plywood. And that is just a sheet of uh, rigid foam. Um, it's considered sort of disposable. I, I use it for so many projects and then it's kind of cut up and then I can throw it away. Um, you can see here, I cut the four by eight sheet of a uh, foam board into three pieces. So it's kind of a fan fold shape so that I can uh, accordion it into a smaller shape and kind of tuck it under the table and not have it in the way when I don't need it. Um, when I do need it, I unfold it onto the tabletop and now I can put a piece of plywood on it and I can cut in any direction and all of my pieces are, are, are perfectly supported and I don't need to worry about my saw blade cutting up my tabletop. It works way better than saw horses. Just uh, something to consider. Um, this is something that I think is not talked about nearly enough when you're building your own cabinetry and that is to create your own square edges on a piece of plywood. If you don't believe me about this, get a stack of plywood, align one edge, try to align the, the end of a sheet and the edge of a sheet, and you will get variation from one sheet to the next in terms of the width and the length. It's not always a lot, uh, but it will vary. And if you don't take that into account right up front, if you don't eliminate that right up front, you'll be chasing it through the whole project. So I always when I take a sheet of plywood and I'm going to process it with the with the track saw down to the parts and pieces I need, I always lay it down. And as you see in the lower left hand, or sorry, in the upper left hand photo, step one is to rip a clean edge. And that doesn't really, you don't need to spend a whole lot of time marking that. Just put the track down, kind of eyeball it, and rip a nice clean strip off in one pass. Then referencing off of that clean rip that you just made, square up in the other direction, and then cut that off, which you see in the lower left-hand corner there is the actual cut. Um, I guess I have those two photos out of order. I'm sorry about that. You square up and then you cut, which is the left-hand photo there. Uh, and now you have two, two edges of the plywood that are perfectly 90 degrees to each other. I use this, this folding aluminum square to get perfect 90 degree corners. It's also really handy when it comes time to insta do installation and pretty much any other Woodworking and carpentry task. It's an awesome tool to have. I highly, highly recommend it. Um, it's if you take the time. Got, to, hey, hey, hey. So, what is this this square thing you're going to talk all about? What is it? Oh, what what is the brand? I think C H Hansen makes it. Um, don't quote me on that, but uh, if you if you go onto Google and just you know search folding uh, folding right angle square. Um, for tile layout or flooring layout, you'll, you'll definitely find it. I think C.H. Hansen makes it. Um, okay, so to me, a sharp pencil is your best tool. I take this really seriously. I like, I like to have my shop set up the way I, get, I can get good results, and I like to have my tools sharp and precise so that I'm not fighting them all the way. So that's why you'll see here when I'm working with the track saw, I it's really important to me to have good light. And you see what good light is labeled. This is from a fine home building article, by the way. So it just happens that these captions work in our favor for this description. But good light in that upper picture there means that I can see that pencil line exactly and I can line up the, the rubber strip on the edge of the track right to that pencil line. If you go to the lower photo, if the light is coming from the other direction, now I'm trying to line something up to a pencil line that's in a shadow. And that little margin of error there, which seems silly, will throw you off when you're trying to do, you know, 20 sheets that all need to be the exact same size. It helps to roll that tape measure to one side. I like to put my two fingers on the tape measure, roll it down flat, and then mark between the two fingers just so I know that I'm not, I'm taking, uh, 
I'm taking any error of the kind of the concave shape of the tape out of the equation. You can also use a framing square or any sort of a, a, a long flat metal uh, ruler or really nice for, for sheet layout as well. And in the last photo there, before I make the cut, I just hook my tape onto that rubber edge of the track and I pull the tape all the way back to uh, the edge of the plywood just to confirm one last time before I clamp it down and make the cut that I am consistent on both both edges of the both ends of that track um, so that I get the width that I want um, and also uh, that it's the exact size that I need. Um, if you're going to be doing some cuts on the table saw, which at a certain point when the pieces get, you know, a little bit on the skinnier side or a little bit on the shorter, smaller side, and you have a lot of them, it, it can make sense to do your long rip cuts and then process the lengths by uh, using the table saw. What you see here is just a kind of a typical shop made cross cut slit. Um, it makes for a really, uh, a really nice, fast, accurate way to get parts sized safely on the table saw. Uh, you don't want to push these narrow pieces. You don't want to push, uh, you know, a narrow, a narrow piece across the saw because if it's longer than it is deep, you have a tendency to, to push it unevenly on the table saw, which is where uh, it's a big risk of kickback. Um, very dangerous situation. If you use a cross cut sled like this, the sled moves, carrying the piece with it, it eliminates any of that pinching situation. It's a lot safer to use. Uh, off on the left, you'll see a little illustration of what to keep in mind when you're processing, processing these sheet goods. Typically, when you buy a sheet of plywood, it'll have one face, one veneer is better than the other one um, because they intend you to uh, only be showing one. You can also purchase plywood that has two, two show quality faces. Um, but when you, so when you identify which of those faces is the the show face, you want to be cutting those uh, sheets so that you're not damaging that show face. And so if you're using the track saw, you want your good show face to be facing down to the tabletop and you're cutting on the backside. If you're working on the table saw because you're, the blade is in, uh, encountering the piece from a, a different position, you want the good face to be up facing you. So in this photo, the show face is facing up. Um, that's going to not only eliminate, it's going to, it's going to greatly reduce uh, splinters and chips on the edges of your cuts. Of course, you still need to have a sharp blade. You still need to use the right blade, which is, um, you know, anything, typically a good combination blade is a, is a good way to go on the table saw, 40 tooth or a 50, 60 tooth uh, alternating bevel or, um, uh, you know, a, a good mixture of rip teeth and, uh, uh, cross cut teeth. I basically just look for a good combination blade. And typically with saw blades, the more you spend, the better the blade is, and the more you can resharpen it. So it's, it's usually a worthy investment not to get a cheap throwaway blade. Um, for box building joinery, uh, biscuits are very popular. Uh, it makes alignment easy to, you, you know, you cut a biscuit slot into both pieces put some glue in there or don't put some glue in there. And some people use the biscuits to actually create the, the connection. Some people use the biscuits only for the purposes of making sure that those pieces are aligned exactly where they want them to be. Uh, obviously biscuits uh, are kind of a modern, <laughs> they're old at this point, but they were a modern replacement for something like the dado cut, which you see in the bottom. Uh, a dado cut is is any slot that's cut, a groove cut into a piece of wood that runs across the grain. Um, dados can be fussy to set up. Uh, if you don't get that dado to be exactly the right width, then your plywood butting into it will either not fit or it'll fit too loosely and it'll be a sloppy connection. Usually once you have the dado set dialed in on your table saw, it's really easy to get a lot of parts run through quickly. Um, but if you're using your table saw and switching operations to do a bunch of things, it can also be a hassle. Uh, and I don't use the dado set typically because I, I, this might be me admitting that I'm just stupid, but it just feels like the place where I always screw up my measurements. Uh, if the dado is, you know, a quarter inch deep, it always feels like the thing where I either forgot to add the quarter inch on either side of the sheet or I, all right, 
you know, I added it on one side, not the other, and then you put everything together and you find out that your cabinet box is the wrong size. Uh, a rabbit is, uh, is a great way, you see that in the top right corner here, a rabbit is a great way to do um, uh, the top or bottom of a sheet of plywood. It's a nice positive way, a lot like that, uh, that uh, end panel connection I showed you several slides back. It, it, this is the same idea, it gives you lots of glue surface, a positive lip to rest the piece on, and, and you can still create a lot of mechanical fastening there with uh, uh, brad nails or screws. Um, this is my favorite approach, which is definitely not called fudge factor approach, but we're going to call it that for this, uh, is this is a, a technique I learned from Mike Maines, who you see in these, in these photos. This is from a past fine home building article. Um, Mike builds the face frames first, like I mentioned, then he builds the boxes, but he just tacks the boxes together with uh, brad nails or, or 16 gauge finish nails, pneumatic nails. Um, and then you lay the face frame on top of the box and nail the sides. And then you, as you see in the, in the upper right hand photo here, then just use a block to kind of tap the, the uh, partitions and shelves inside the box into alignment with the face frame. Uh, if you're building your own cabinetry and you're not super experienced, this is going to be your absolute best friend when it comes to building a cabinet because it can be really annoying and really frustrating to plan your face frame, then build your plywood box, and then you put the two together and your shelf it sticks up just a little bit past your face frame or a little bit below your face frame, or it's a little bit off to one side. If you do this method, it allows you to kind of knock some things into alignment. And then once you have everything the way you want, then you can drive screws in through the sides of the cabinets. You'll also see here in this photo uh, that there are pairs of pocket hole screws. And again, this is a tip I learned from Mike is if you have pairs of, if you bore pairs of pocket hole screws, that way when you're going to attach your face frame, if uh, the first pocket hole that you try and put a screw through tends to drift something out of alignment, it's, you just abandon that one and then switch to the other pocket hole. So you get two tries basically for every fastener. It gives you a little more, almost no time when you're milling the, the, the plywood panels and the pocket holes to start with, but it pays dividends in the end in terms of flexibility and kind of back doors to get out of problems. Uh, you see on the left-hand side here, that's me. Uh, shooting a face frame onto a plywood box with finish nails. This is how I almost exclusively do it. If it was a really nice stain grade project where I was afraid I wasn't going to be able to conceal those nail holes, I might do something like you see in the right hand side, which is pocket screws or uh, biscuits or um, domino tenons and clamps just to hold everything until the glue dries. Um, I don't typically have a problem attaching the face frames with nails and filling the nail holes. Uh, I find that I can hide the nail holes pretty easily. This just is a way to speed things up and not have to uh, fuss around too much with clamps and, and, all, and all the layout of the, uh, either the domino tenons or the biscuits. Um, the next, you know, I, I would say that the, the, uh, the pocket screws from the backs, from the, from the sides of the cabinet, which you see on the right-hand side here, is kind of the next best thing to me. Uh, it's a little less fussy than tenons or dominoes. I'm sorry, dominoes or, or biscuits, um, while still being fairly qu quick to do. And of course, you see me in the background of that photo wearing the exact same shirt again. So I guess I like that shirt. I don't know. Uh, let's just do real quick on shelf edges here. Um, let's see a time check. Oh, we're getting close to seven. I got to speed up. All right. So shelf edges. You get a lot of different options. Um, all the way on the left-hand side is a very thin veneer. Uh, that could either be iron-on edging or you can do a shop-made veneer, which is the next one over, which is about an eighth inch thick solid wood. Um, then you see kind of a V-groove shape, uh, which is really nice because it gives you a lot of solid gluing surface. Uh, it, it locates itself really nicely in that V-shaped groove. Uh, and it gives you nice, crisp, clean edges. The other three from there, you know, the last three on the right are kind of variations of a tongue and groove kind of uh, setup where you have a, a more chunky, uh, either glued on or nailed on edge to your shelf. And those tend to be a little more visible when you paint things or stain them. 
uh, no matter how when you when you glue them on for a paint grade, uh, no matter how much you sand them and get them perfect, you always seem to see a little bit of a seam there with the solid wood edge like that. So the one of the three options over on the left is is typically my favorite, um, but the ones on the right are also a possibility. Veneer edges, um, like I mentioned, this is you know heat them up with an iron, self adhesive. This is what you're going to see. I would say most of the time when you order ready to assemble cabinetry, especially melamine, this is the way that they always do it. Um, you uh, use blue painter's tape to kind of hold things in position as the glue sets up um, from, or, or sorry, as the glue cools down and sets up. Um, this is that V-shaped edging and a little quick diagram of the, of the two table saw setups that you use to create it. Um, basically uh, use the sacrificial fence on your table saw so that you can sneak that piece of plywood up closer to the blade to get that nice, um, nice angled cut into the center of the plywood. Then you can just flip that fence the other side of the saw blade uh, to cut the matching piece and you'll get, um, you get a perfect marriage between those two pieces. And you see in the upper left-hand photo, the piece being fit in there, it's a little bit wider than you actually need, which is ideal. You glue it in and then you can just block plane those, those little lips off and you end up with a nice, perfect uh, looking front shelf edge. Uh, one last little trick here for when you're uh, applying those shelf edges um, is to use, if you see on that left-hand side there, that piece of poplar that, is, that we're using for a, a clamping call, is it has a, a shadow line in it on the, right between it and the, and the shelf edge that you're gluing on. And that's a very slight concave shape to that, um, that clamping call. And that, so that when you squeeze that one clamp in the middle, it helps to really evenly distribute that uh, clamping force all along the whole length of that clamping call. It makes it, means that you can use less clamps and still get a really nice tight joint um, between that edge and the plywood shelf. Um, getting towards the end here with uh, kind of my, my advice to share, but one thing is that I, I always design any kitchen cabinetry that I'm building to have a separate base that's not connected. Um, we talked about toe kicks. This is essentially the toe kick. It's four inches tall. And uh, I make it out of, uh, sometimes it's scrap cheapo plywood that I have. Sometimes it's just the cutoffs from making the rest of the cabinet. And uh, it's just a simple grid pattern nailed together, screwed together. And then you put those bases on the floor, you shim underneath them use in the upper right hand photo here you see once you have everything shimmed and leveled in both directions you put these little blocks all the way down so they touch the floor and you screw them to the base and they become kind of permanent screwed on feet that lock in that that level plumb position so then you can take out your shims uh, and get them out of the equation super handy to be able to do it this way it's a lot faster than having to trim a full cabinet to fit the floor uh, I highly recommend this approach. Um, lastly here, I like to, uh, when you're building something in the shop, leave yourself wiggle room. You'll see here that the parts in the bottom here, the bracket bases and such are longer than are necessary um, in all the places where you, you are gonna have unknowns that you need to trim on site. The, the face frame panels extend past the end panels. Um, this is obviously not a kitchen cabinet. It's a, it's a built-in bench seat for a kitchen, but the same rules apply to kitchen cabinets. Um, so lastly, we didn't talk about doors and drawers. And the reason I don't talk about doors and drawers is because I tend not to build them. Um, I think that it's very hard, unless you're a professionally oriented cabinet shop that's doing this all day, every day, to make to be fast enough to make money at building your own doors and drawers. So typically I would build the boxes and the face frames and any of the special details that you want to make things look really custom. And then I would go to some place and I would, I would order the, uh, the drawer boxes, which I would typically get in a knockdown fashion. They're, um, it, they come with the base and the four sides and then you just glue them up, uh, glue up the dovetail joints and apply your own drawer front um, with the doors. I should say that you can also order the, the drawer boxes fully assembled and even pre-finished. And then the doors, same thing. Um, it, those are fussy router setups typically. There's a million different ways you get a million different styles of door. It makes no sense to me to make my own unless 
unless uh, you know I'm trying to match some species of wood or something like that. Uh, they're much cheaper to just buy them. They're super high quality typically, and you can have them already bored in the backside for cup hinges if you want. So that's kind of out of order there, but there we go. My, this, is, this is what I meant to say. What about doors and drawers? And then show you the doors and drawers, but that's okay. Um, all right, how did I do? Look at that, seven on the dot. You did great. I want to ask uh, Shane to come back here because I would like him to tell us. So I've made some cabinets, Justin, not nearly as many as you. And I, I, I learned a lot of stuff tonight. Um, good job. Uh, but it doesn't make any sense to do those parts that you're talking about. Shane, what does your company do to make this cabinet building process easier for carpenters and contractors? We, we offer cabinets in any size, dimension, uh, width, height, depth. We build everything to less than 30 seconds uh, tolerances. So if you order a box that's 16 and a 16th, that's the size box that you should get. Um, we build cabinets out of all, all, all different materials, plywoods, veneers, uh, pre-finished plywoods, uh, unfinished melamines, textured melamines, acrylics. Um, everything that we do is unfinished though. So all of the finishing has to be done on your end, unless you get the, the finished products that uh, some of our suppliers provide for us. And how does the ordering process work? Does, do folks do that on the website? Do they call you? How's that work? So we have a order form online that you can download. And then you fill in the information on what you want your boxes to be made out of. And then you just list out all of the boxes, doors, door fronts, anything that you would like for us to build. We'll build just the doors. We'll build just the adjustable shelves. If you want just the drawer boxes. Or we'll build all of it. And then everything comes to you flat packed, ready to assemble. Um, everything's shipped on common carrier. Uh, the good thing about where we're located is every you don't. Uh, it's not a real big export town, so mm. we get really good rates on everything that leaves here. We get about eighty five percent off all freight rates. So um, typical job cost between two and 500 bucks to ship pretty much anywhere in the country. So, um, and what is the, the typical turnaround? Cause that's always a, uh, you know, of interest to folks who are building stuff. Right. And also, especially with the current climate with, yeah. you know, cabinets are becoming hard to find. Are, are you guys also log jammed or is it, are you keeping I can up? I'll tell you up until probably two months ago, we were about eight to 10 weeks from the time you, approve the order until it ships. Mm -hmm. We've gotten a lot more efficient in the last few months, and we've got that down to about three weeks. Wow. So you, yeah, no, it's, we, 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 we've gone through a lot. We've, we've taken a lot of steps in order to try to make things more efficient for us and for you. I mean, it's, it's hard for a customer to wait 10 weeks. Well, yeah, I mean, it's it's so we're trying everything we can to make that as painless as possible. One of our uh, Q&A uh, questions just recently was like, how do you locate the cup hinge location? Is that up to the uh, person who orders it or is those standard? How does that work? <clears throat> we we have our own placement, but if you have your own where you want it, three and a quarter or whatever you can think of, we'll, we'll place it there. You just need to tell us. We are a, we are a true custom outsourced cabinet shop. There's, if you can think of it and that's what you would like for us to do, just let us know and that we'll, we'll do that. It's, there's not, it's not ordering it out of a magazine or out of a catalog. It's completely custom for whatever you need. Hey, Justin, someone asked in the Q&A uh, about using router bits for cutting dados. Uh, have you had any success with that? Yeah, there's a, there's, so here's the thing. When you buy a, a sheet of three quarter inch plywood, it's not exactly three quarters of an inch. When you buy a three quarter inch router bit, it's usually exactly three quarters of an inch. So you try and marry those two things up, use a three quarter inch router bit, and that plywood is not going to fit in it. But they do make, uh, some companies make router bits sized to match plywood. So you can use that 
uh, to make a nice one swipe dado that your plywood sheet should fit into. Uh, another way you can do it is if you have, um, uh, uh, you can, you can uh, do a router bit, like a half inch router bit, and then wrap it one side of your plywood so that it slides into that half inch groove perfectly. So basically undersize it a little bit. Everyone might know this, but, uh, you know, I, I immediately asked you about the giant square you had and the <laughs> other folks did too, right? Because that's a notable tool. Uh, Kenneth said uh, it's a Bond tool, 21, 360, 48 inch aluminum trifold paver square. So anyone is looking for that tool, I wrote it down. Uh, that's, that's Bond tool. That does sound yeah. familiar. And I've got a bunch of other stuff in Bond tool. They make some nice stuff. Yeah, that square is awesome. It rides in my van every day. I use it for so many things. <laughs> um, Robert asked, is there a minimum order, uh, Shane, for cabinet parts? And uh, how long, well, we, we answered that, how long the turnaround is, but uh, is there a minimum order? How's that work? There is not a minimum order. Um, you can order one shelf, one drawer box, one cabinet. Um, up to 500 cabinets it's it, it's totally up what what you what you need for sure some folks are worried about uh damage to you know expensive cabinet parts how do you guys protect the stuff from being damaged and shipping to the job site that's um so we anything that's about four or five hours away from us we recommend putting the hard side pallet on or hard siding the pallet so what we do is then take OSB and wrap it all the way around on the top and on all the sides. Um, that, that seems to mitigate a lot of that, those problems. We do, I mean, they, there is shipping problems, but we, we kind of know where all the good places are and where we're not having any problems. And we try to act accordingly, for sure. Well, we are like, running over is there anything you guys want to say uh before we go there, there was one last question that just came in from from one of the the attendees was about design and i was curious shane if you if you guys do any design do you offer design services too? any sort of help in that department i can tell you i can tell you that we don't offer that but we are looking into programs that you will be able to Hopefully I'm not speaking out of turn here. We're looking <laughs> into programs. We know if we kept you on here long enough, Shane. That's what we do. <laughs> I might well, get now you have to do it. I might get in trouble. <laughs> we are looking into programs that you will be able to design with, and it will automatically do the pricing for you, and you'll hit the button, and it'll send it to us, and we can put it directly into production. Not, I mean, yeah. into the production line. That's even so, better than what I was hoping for. Yeah, that's, that's cool and uh gosh with how long it takes to get stuff and the labor shortages that so much of the industry is is dealing with it's like it makes a lot of sense to me yeah i gotta say kudos to you guys for getting that lead time down to three weeks because i mean i i haven't seen that even before covid um and uh <laughs> you know to be able to to be, I mean, it's so it's so huge because it, you guys know things change uh, as you're flying. You know, a cabinet size needs to change, or you you screwed something up and you need to order a replacement. And having to wait eight to ten weeks for another door to come in is a real. It could be a real gut punch, you know. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's and and okay. Say you do order something wrong, or something does get damaged. We're going to turn that around in two or three days. We're we're not even right. going to wait for three weeks. I mean, if there's that's a problem. Beautiful. We'll, we'll try to get it fixed right now because we know you guys are needed. That's that's great. It was great hanging out with you all. It was fun, and I want to thank everyone who uh, is in the audience for being here. It was it was a good uh, good show. It was great, and yeah, I especially and I'm, I'm th happy. I'm happy to share. Sorry, I didn't drop you back. I'm happy to. Some people have been asking. I'm I'm happy to send the. Uh, the slides so that anybody can look back on this, but a lot of that content you saw in the slides came from fine home building articles and fine woodworking articles. So um, there's that and a million times more. So definitely subscribe if you're not already. For sure.
Hey, thanks very much to Cab Parts, our sponsor, and also thanks to Justin for a great presentation. Thanks to Shane for helping out with the Q&A. That was fantastic. And uh, boy, come again, everybody. That was a good show, and, and I hope we do this in the, in the future ongoing, right? Agreed. That was nice. All right, guys. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Good night.